So I'm going to lead it right into introducing my colleague, Susan Rowlett. She is the program director for the Dementia Care Collaborative, and she's a clinical social worker here at MGH, and she often works in geriatric psychiatry. So Susan, I send it over to you, and I'm going to highlight your video, but Chris already did. All right, thank oh, you. Oh, great. Thank you, Nori. Thank you for organizing everything and keeping us all together. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our program this afternoon. We're very excited to have our speaker today. I just want to briefly, I know many of you may know, but just in case, I want to stress that the Dementia Care Collaborative is a is an uh, umbrella program for many smaller programs. So one of the programs in within the Dementia Care Collaborative is our caregiver support program. And this is a health and resiliency presentation for our caregiver support program. Um, we, we launched in 2017. It will be three years in November. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're part of the Division of palli Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine. Um, as you know, many of you are, the mission of our program of the Dementia Care Collaborative is nothing less than transforming healthcare. That is really our large goal. So we are working from all, all angles of the hospital and um, just want you to know that we're really trying to improve dementia care for those who are diagnosed and their families and caregivers um, so that the, the journey of this disease is more manageable. Um, and so we are doing that a lot of different ways through programs like this. We also offer care consultations to caregivers and patients in specific Massachusetts General Hospital clinics. We have um, skills classes uh, for caregivers, support groups, and another health and resiliency program that's part of this, which is called Ageless Grace, which I'll just say quickly is a movement and music program that's held twice a week online. It's fantastic, it's fun, and very uh, good for our mind, body, and souls. And uh, Nori Mazzone, our program coordinator who introduced me today is the facilitator for that. So um, if anyone is interested in more information about Ageless Grace, please uh, either put it in the chat box or send Nori an email. Um, the caregiver support program is entirely funded through philanthrop philanthropic support. And so if you are interested in learning how to support our program, please reach out to us, reach out to Nori, uh, myself, or the uh, Dementia Care Collaborative email. So I'm going to move on now. Thank you for listening to my, for bearing with me about our program. And I want to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Miguel Rivera. Dr. Rivera is an adult psychiatrist in private practice in Sarasota, Florida, and is the medical director for Tri-Yoga International. He speaks internationally on the influence of lifestyle in Alzheimer's and related disorders. He comes to us with extensive experience caring for people with memory disorders, their family, their paid caregivers, whether they're in the home or in a care facility. His holistic approach has significantly reduced the use of medications for mood and behavior problems and has equally improved quality of life for his patients and all of their caregivers and his colleagues, I will add on a personal note. So Dr. Rivera, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. Oh, yes. I'll turn so it welcome. over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne and Nori for inviting me. Uh, I am so excited about being here. And, uh, you know, Susan, just to echo the words that you said, you know, about transforming healthcare, well, everything begins with knowledge. You know, once we get a new piece of information, then we can make a new choice. And I hope that, that this uh, quick talk will kind of open up your mind about uh, things to maybe be mindful about that we hadn't really thought before. So that being said, then I'm going to take a second here and bring up the slides and please feel free to follow with that. Okay, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. All righty, so medicine cabinet mayhem. Um, the number one thing I do when I see a patient, particularly a new client, is go over the medication list. And the reason for that is that this is such a high yield aspect of the practice. 
most of the patients that I see are taking medications that are making them worse. So without any ado, let's, oh yes, well, I don't have any disclosures. <laughs> so, and no conflicts of interest. So every opinion here is, is just my opinion. And no matter what I say, we can just keep calm and relax because tomorrow is Friday. <laughs> And uh, again, in keeping with what Susan just said about transforming and moving forward with new ideas about how to do things with healthcare and with our own lives, then my, like my uncle Al here used to say, we cannot solve problems using the same thinking that we use when we created them. So hopefully this will be useful, enlightening information. So words to live by. Any symptom in an elderly person should be considered a medication side effect unless proven otherwise. And this is basically the scope that I take with my practice. I definitely do um, you know, laboratories and imaging and the, you know, PET scans and MRIs and those things that are available to us. But the knowledge and the understanding that, that most likely what we are seeing as a medication side effect is always at the forefront of my thinking. And why is that? Well, let's take a quick look. If you, I got this information from the CDC website. And if you check it out right now, you can find this information there. And this issue with medicines is so dramatic because like I say in the uh, CDC website, 82% of American adults take at least one prescription medicine, and 29% or more take five or, I'm sorry, 29% take five or more. And if you look at folks 65 and over, then 40% of people take between five and nine medications, and approximately 20% take over 10 medications. The chances of interactions and side effects is truly dramatic once you get into those numbers. So this method or way of practicing medicine and prescribing medications has ended up with uh, our healthcare system experiencing 1.3 million ER visits every year. And those ER visits translate to approximately 350,000 admissions because of adverse drug events. For those 65 and over, the numbers are 450,000 ER visits with 100 and 25,000 hospitalizations. This is about a cost of approximately three and a half billion dollars a year on medical costs. And most of them, or at least about half of them, are thought to be preventable. So some of the data that highlights how these medications can affect the elderly is uh, this study from uh, the Journal of American Geriatrics, about one in three older pe persons taking at least five medications will have an adverse drug event each year. So 33% of those people who take five or more medications will have an adverse drug event every year. And this is significant because older adults are two and a half times more likely to end up in the ER and seven times more likely to be hospitalized because of an, of an adverse drug event uh, than a younger individual. This also translates to about 100,000 deaths per year, making adverse drug events one of the leading causes of death in the United States. Now this is also, I just pulled it up from the CDC website last night, and it talks about some of the data I just gave, but I wanted to highlight a couple of things. Here it is. Most of these hospitalizations are due to a few drugs that should be monitored carefully to prevent problems. Some of these are blood thinners, in particular Coumadin or Warfarin, diabetes medications such as insulin, and the number three is digoxin. So Coumadin, insulin, and digoxin are the three main medications that will end up people in the emergency room. 
There's also seizure medications such as Dilantin and Tegretol, and also opioid analgesics. Now, where is a good place for us to get information about these medications that can be potentially problematic in the elderly? And um, luckily, we have this amazing document, which I use frequently in my practice. I give it to other doctors, other professionals, give it to family members and patients, which is the BEERS criteria. And this is from the American Geriatric Society, and they update it. I think it started in like 1997 and they, it gets updated every few years and it has, uh, it's a, it provides a list of medications and circumstances uh, of medicines that can be problematic or that should generally be avoided in the elderly. Uh, the other thing that I look at is this online drug interaction checker. I actually have it on my iPhone and when I do a visit with the patient, I input all the medications and see whether any significant side effects uh, pop up. So I would encourage you, you know, to find one. There are many online where you can uh, input your medicines and see what it says and then armed with that knowledge, then you can maybe see your primary care doctor and express if you have any concerns. Now, in, particularly, in particular to our focus, which is dementia, cognition, memory, uh, there is a section of the BEERS criteria that is actually dedicated to highlighting which ones are the medications that are considered to be anticholinergic. Now, maybe you can recognize some of these. Uh, Benadryl, for example, you know, considered to be safe and effective, and you can just run over to the pharmacy or supermarket and, uh, and buy yourself some of that. Uh, Benadryl is also the active ingredient in ibuprofen PM, Tylenol PM, and many other medications that help you sleep at night. Uh, medications like oxybutynin is a bladder medicine used for incontinence, so is Detrol, and uh, this uh, genetic sleep aid has a uh, anticholinergic in it called doxylamine, and it, it is um, also a uh, problematic medication. Now, before we define an anticholinergic, we need to talk a little bit about acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter, both in the central, meaning the brain and the spinal cord, and in the peripheral, uh, our limbs, uh, organs, in the peripheral nervous system. And it is also one of the most important neurochemicals involved in cognition. So acetylcholine, for example, is the neurochemical that is responsible for muscle contraction. So things like muscle relaxants, medications for the bladder, uh, medications for GI spasms, all of those medicines, they work through acetylcholine. Unfortunately, the problem is that you, most of the time we cannot preferentially block the acetylcholine in the peripheral nervous system. Most of the medications cross the blood brain barrier and they can cause significant cognitive problems as well. So in, on this little cartoon over on the left side, we see that this here is acetylcholine and it is made within the, uh, within the body of the nerve cell and it gets packaged into little vesicles. And when the time comes, then these vesicles are joined in to the membrane and they spill the contents. And in general, they will come here and act with the acetylcholine receptor. So medications that actually block the receptor are called anticholinergics. So medications that block the action of acetylcholine. Now, why is this important? These medications, galantamine, donepezil, and rivastigmine, or rasodine, aricept, and exelon, they all work by increasing the levels of acetylcholine. Now, I will tell you that it is not unusual for me to see a patient who is taking a medication for bladder incontinence and is also taking aricept because they have memory problems. And these two medicines cannot negate each other's effect. 
And in particular, the anticholinergics uh, will keep the Aricep or the galantamine or the rivastigmine from actually being able to help. So what are some medical uses of these anticholinergic drugs? Why would you be prescribed one of them? Well, very commonly they're used for GI disorders, things like gastritis, abdominal spasms and colic, uh, diverticulitis and colitis. They are frequently used for genital urinal disorders, in particular incontinence. And you know, it's such a kind of a travesty that when, when people become incontinent is when, when, when people get older and the medicines that are available for this, most of them are uh, problematic for cognition, for memory, for behaviors, and for the brain health in general. Uh, their uh, anticholinergics are used for respiratory disorders such as asthma and COPD. Most muscle relaxants are anticholinergic medications. Uh, medications for Parkinson's disease or for Parkinsonism also are medications that are anticholinergic. So many over-the-counter and prescription antihistamines, uh, which are used for allergies, cold medications, have ingredients in them that are anticholinergic. Most over-the-counter sleep aids, uh, whether it's Tylenol PM or Acetaminophen PM, uh, uh, Sominex, Unisom, all of those are anticholinergic medications. And anticholinergics are also used to dilate the pupil. So I just want to show you some of the hidden anticholinergics, um, and you will see that you will recognize them immediately. Now, this up upper list here, uh, these are over-the-counter medicines, and the diphenhydramine is the other name for Benadryl, and it's right here. And it is also the active ingredient that helps you sleep in NyQuil. And again, like I said, in Tylenol PM, and so many, for example, of the multi-symptom medications for cold and flu that have like an AM and a PM. So most of the PM medications, the active ingredient that helps you sleep is a sedating or first generation antihistamine. Medications for sleep, Staminex and Unisom. Uh, the Staminex is the doxylamine. Um, the Unisom has Benadryl in it as well. Uh, chlorpheniramine is the active ingredient in chlortrimeton. Uh, which is a medicine that I took a lot when I was growing up as a kid in Puerto Rico. Um, and the diphenhydronate is the active ingredient in Dramamine. Now, I mentioned here famotidine, which is the active ingredient in Pepsid, and also Zantac. And in the Beers criteria for 2015, these medications were included on the list. And for this year, for our last year, for 2019, they were actually removed partially because the, there were some issues regarding which one was safer in terms of using a proton pump inhibitor or using these H2 blockers. And I will show you some data regarding that, in particular as it regards to the Pepsid. Uh, these other medications here on, on the second list are mostly prescription medicines. So tolterodine is, is the other name for detrol, which is an incontinence medicine. Oxybutynin is ditropan. Solifenacin is vesicare. And flavoxate is urispas. So all of these are very, very common medications that I find in so many of my patients with mild cognitive impairment or with frank dementia. And to tell you the truth, I've, I've, I've stopped these medicines countless times when they're given to people who are, are incontinent. So they're, they're taking these medicines, they're still incontinent, the medicines have not been able to work and somehow they're still taking them. So it is important to make sure that your doctor is always keeping up with your medicines and that you're not taking redundant medications or medications that you or your loved one uh, no longer need. So hydroxyzine, another name for it is this fellow here, Adorax. And it is a very commonly prescribed sedating antihistamine. Amitriptyline, the other name for that is Elevil. And it, it's maybe not used so much as an antidepressant anymore, 
but it's certainly used for things like peripheral neuropathy and radiculopathies and other different types of uh, pain, migraine, headaches, and things like that. And it is a powerful anticholinergic drug. Uh, paroxetine is the name for Paxil, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, a very, very commonly used antidepressant. It is the most anticholinergic in its class. I tend to not prescribe either Elevil nor Paxil, even though I do get it, you know, do get patients that are on them. And most of the time what I do is I try to migrate them off of these medicines, unless it's something that, you know, has worked. It's the only thing that has worked, in which case I try to just manage the side effects. And uh, last but not least, these two medicines, carisoprodol and cyclobenzaprine, are both muscle relaxants. Carisoprodol is a... Uh, uh, soma and cyclobenzaprine is Lexaril. Now, if you go and you check the beers criteria, so just search under it when you get home today or whenever you have a chance and just put two, uh, 2019 beers criteria and you can go to table seven and you will see that these are drugs with strong anticholinergic properties. Now, again, you will not find the H2 blockers here and some of the medicines that are more mildly anticholinergic. These are medicines that we know for sure are some of the heavy hitters. And if you're taking these med one of these medicines, it may be a good idea to discuss that with your doctor because there may be safer, less anticholinergic medications uh, for you or for your loved one. I actually would like to show you how many drug classes uh, contain medications that are anticholinergic. So right here, it says antiarrhythmic, uh, antidepressants, you know, many, most of them tricyclics, but here's the Paxil, uh, medications for nausea, uh, usually, you know, antihistamines, usually the first generation antihistamines like Benadryl and hydroxyzine, uh, medications for vertigo, uh, medications for uh, GI spasms, medications for incontinence, anti-Parkinsonian agents, antipsychotic drugs, uh, again, uh, antispasmodics or uh, muscle relaxants. Um, so many, many different classes. I mean, there's several cardiac medicines that also have anticholinergic side effects. So definitely uh, uh, worthwhile having an awareness that there's definitely medicines there that we haven't really thought about that can affect our cognition and actually set us up to develop dementia if we take these medicines for prolonged periods of time. So this is a case report that actually came out of USF where I did my residency and, and actually came out while I was a resident in uh, 2001. And this was a series of patients at Tampa General Hospital and what we found was this, six cases of Pepsid or famotidine induced delirium in hospitalized patients that completely resolved once the medication was stopped. As soon as I get a patient on famotidine, it's coming off. I don't even think about it. Uh, it's kind of a no brainer for me. I know that this medicine has the potential to really create significant cognitive impairment and precipitate delirium in, in the elderly and in particularly those that have cognitive problems. Now this is another study, uh, uh, and actually it's a Japanese study, and they looked at patients that were having a hepatectomy or they were having their liver uh, uh, removed. And, and these patients are in particular uh, susceptible to developing delirium um, so let me just share with you a little expanded view here. So here it is. Hepatectomy is a highly invasive procedure with a high probability of post-op delirium. So anti-ulcer drugs are indispensable. And in this case, they looked at people who were 65 years of older, and they, were, they either gave them injectable famotidine or injectable omeprazole, which is the other name for Prilosec and it's a uh, over-the-counter hydrogen pump blocker. And what they found was that the incidence of delirium was 90% on the famotidine group compared to 27% in the omeprazole group. So no question about it, this medicine is significantly neuroactive. 
Interestingly, four of the nine patients that received dephamatidine required an antipsychotic drug to manage their delirium, as opposed to no recipients uh, of, on the omeprazole group. So not only did this medicine make people sick, they also had to take a drug that in general, I don't like, I only use as last resort, which is the Haldol. It's a really powerful antipsychotic drug. So not only did the Pepsid create problems on its own, also the medicines associated with dealing with the side effects can be problematic. So what are some of the side effects of anticholinergic drugs? Well, first one uh, is ataxia or problems with ambulation, uh, loss of coordination, uh, problems with balance. Um, they can uh, uh, create dry mouth, and so please remember this one because it's one of the ways in which you can um, anticipate an anticholinergic is when they give you dry mouth and constipation. So uh, that should alert you when you get your medicine from the pharmacy or your loved one and uh, you look and see, oh, this can give dry mouth and constipation. Ding, 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 that little light should go on that maybe this is a medicine worth investigating. Uh, because of the dry mouth, people get increased cavities. Um, they also affect perspiration, uh, which can give people, you know, warm, blotchy red skin, and it also increases bodily temperature. It can create significant vision changes, such as pupillary dilatation, as well as loss of accommodation or the focusing ability in the eye. Uh, they can also create double vision. So, I mean, what a tandem, right? First of all, it affects your gait and your balance, and then it also affects your vision. So what does that set you up for? Definitely falls. And we know that anticholinergics frequently make elderly people fall, and they are a risk factor for increased uh, hip fractures. Anticholinergic drugs uh, cause urinary retention and constipation, like I said, the increased intraocular pressure, and they can also create shaking or restlessness. Now, most of the patients who come to my service come because they're having these side effects. So most of the anticholinergic drugs are notorious for precipitating delirium. And this delirium uh, is defined as an acute change in mental status. And the hallmark of delirium is waxing and waning of consciousness or awareness. What this means is that the person can be totally okay now and in two, three minutes, they can be completely disoriented, hallucinating, uh, paranoid that people are, right, are out to poison them. And 10 minutes later, they can be having a completely normal conversation. So this waxing and waning is very, very typical of delirium, as is problems with attention. You cannot get people to uh, pay attention to you. They're constantly distractible and kind of all over the place. Uh, so increased confusion, uh, most of the time delirium is associated with some degree of agitation. Uh, hospital people are notorious for pulling IVs and, uh, and creating all kinds of problems when they become uh, delirious. Uh, cognitive decline, uh, incoherent speech, uh, disorientation, um, also a circadian rhythm disruption, very common for delirious people to sundown, to be agitated in the later parts of the day or early evening. Um, also, uh, uh, visual disturbances, uh, visual hallucinations are very common in delirium. And, and delusional thinking, like I just mentioned, you know, people will think that they're being poisoned or that uh, they're, uh, you know, people are, you know, coming to hurt them. Uh, so, uh, very, very common and um, significant side effect of anticholinergic drugs is uh, precipitation of delirium, particularly in those who already have a diagnosis of dementia or cognitive decline. So anticholinergic toxicity. So there is even a mnemonic to help medical students and residents remember what this looks like. And it's so mad as a hatter uh, because of the delirium, blind as a bat, uh, because of the problems with the, uh, uh, the pupils as well as the uh, double vision, et cetera. Red as the beet uh, because of the flushed uh, skin and the problems with perspiration. Uh, dry as the bone, uh, dry mouth, dry eyes, dry bladder, kind of constipation, all of those. And hot as the hair from the increase in bodily temperature. So 
So I, I just brought a couple of studies where I just wanted to show you so that you won't think that I'm just making this stuff up. Dr. Um, Rivera, I, yes. I just, I just want to um, make a note of time. Please. We, yeah. So no, like five minutes? I have less? Five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Susan. Okay. So let's see. So this is a study from France in which they looked at uh, almost 7,000 uh, people, 65 and over, and they, follow in, they followed them uh, for, uh, two and four years, and they evaluated cognitive performance, uh, clinical diagnosis of dementia, and anticholinergic use. And what they found was a 1.4 to two-fold increase in cognitive decline as opposed to those who were not taking anticholinergics or those who took them and had stopped them. And what they also noticed was that the risk of incident dementia after four years of follow-up was also increased in people who, um, who, take, who took chronic anticholinergics, um, but not so for people who had already stopped them. Okay, so conclusion, elderly people taking anticholinergic drugs were at increased risk for cognitive decline and dementia. So, and this is not the only study. I mean, there are several here. I just pulled one uh, from my uh, Harvard uh, newsletter. And here it is, uh, uh, common anticholinergics uh, like Benadryl increase to increase, uh, linked to increased dementia risk. And uh, briefly, this is the study uh, that they're mentioning. And they're saying that the most common classes uh, that they viewed in their study were tricyclic antidepressants, antihistamines and bladder medications. And again, a higher cumulative anticholinergic use is associated with an increased risk of dementia. And this one is basically the same. This is actually a 2019 study that just came out. And again, uh, increases in dementia risk for anticholinergic antidepressants, Parkinson's medicines, bladder medicines, antipsychotics and seizure medications. Again, once more, exposure to these types of medications is not good if you want to keep your wits about you. And this is a study from Indiana in which uh, they uh, looked at over 3,000 patients in primary care clinics. And what they found was that 50% of those patients with dementia were taking at least one anticholinergic drug, and 20% were taking at least one psychotropic medication. Okay, so briefly, I just want you to again see how these classes just, how these medications span all different classes from GI medicines to muscle relaxants, to medications for Parkinsonism, incontinence, antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, cardiovascular, and pain medicines. So big take home message, if it gives you dry mouth and constipation, look it up, it may be an anticholinergic drug. So quickly, safer alternatives for allergies, uh, the neti pot, uh, the, the, it's basic, uh, uh, iteration here, just a little bit of water, make sure that the water is clean and filter and boil before you use it. But there are other, you know, kind of fancier uh, things in the market that, uh, that you can use, but basically flushing out your sinuses a few times a week works, works great for allergies. Um, uh, this is something that I personally use. It's a, it's a homeopathic uh, medication for uh, allergies and, and it works great. Uh, it's not as strong as uh, typical pharmaceutical agents, but I think it works well. And if you must have a pharmaceutical uh, um, product, then the Allegra is the uh, most benign. Uh, for incontinence, I send my patients a lot for pelvic floor retraining and bladder training. It is the number one thing I, I try to do for my patients. Uh, if um, you must have a, a medicine for incontinence, then even though definitely not side effect free, the Merbitrec is the least associated with cognitive effects, even though it can still cause them. But at least it's not an anticholinergic. Uh, safer alternatives for muscle relaxants. Um, uh, magnesium is fantastic, whether you take it by mouth uh, in like a powder or a pill or whether you wanna take a bath and, and soak in some Epsom salt. 
it really helps with uh, uh, muscle soreness and cramping. I was going to say we should all be getting massages, but with COVID, that's kind of not being so frequent. Um, uh, chamomile and peppermint oil are things that can help, both topical as well as ingesting them. And again, if uh, your symptoms are bad enough that you need to take a medicine, the scalaxin is not an anticholinergic. Uh, so a pretty safe medicine uh, to use. Um, and last but not least, um, because so many of the over-the-counter medicines are for sleep, um, then I just wanted to go through some of the things that um, we, number one in the pink here, should be doing a little bit of every day to make sure that we sleep well at night, which is, you know, getting plenty of sunshine and fresh air. The sunshine is what helps us to reset the circadian rhythm. Um, so important if you want to sleep at night and be awake during the day. Um, daily exercise, you get your body tired, you'll go to sleep easier. Uh, do not nap for longer than an hour uh, in the afternoon if you must. Uh, avoid late, heavy, spicy meals and avoid fluids after dinner. That way you won't have to get up as much to use the restroom. Uh, avoid things like caffeine and, and uh, TV and things that can be stimulating. Um, even though alcohol makes you, makes you fall asleep faster, it keeps us from attaining the deeper stages of restorative sleep. So alcohol is not good if you're having difficulty sleeping. And of course, check your medicines. So many medications are known uh, for causing sleep problems. Um, on the night, on, the, on a daily evening, uh, it's great to have a pre-sleep routine, maybe about an hour before you're ready to go to bed. Uh, dim, the uh, dim the lights and take a shower. Uh, uh, the, the, the water is calming to the body and the mind. It helps to relax us. Um, and dimming the lights is important and particularly avoiding blue lights and LEDs which affect melatonin production and that is the hormone that helps us fall asleep at night and sets our circadian rhythm. Uh, spending some conscious relaxation time, the mind needs time to unwind from the day and if you don't give it that time, it is going to take it while you're trying to fall asleep. So most important to spend some time listening to your favorite music or watching your breath or doing something that can help you relax. Make the room dark, cool and quiet. Uh, use music or nature sounds to help you fall asleep. And, and a trick that I use is that when I go to bed at night, I try to see how relaxed I can be without actually falling asleep. And uh, most of the time that uh, kind of does the trick for me. So that is it for the first part. And um, I hope I didn't go over too much there, dear. Not Sandy. at all. You did great. <laughs> so no, I think I <laughs> we'll take the slides down so we can um, see you better for these. We've got a, really, a lot of really great questions. And I know we want to save time at the end for a brief sort of exercise. Okay. So, you know, I don't know what's going to happen once I come off of the slides. I may have to reload them and it may be temperamental with that, but I am. Um, happy to uh, happy to. Oh, well, why don't you keep them up for the questions then? That's absolutely fine. Okay. I'll ask you the questions. Okay. Okay. So, um, whoops. Okay. I think you. Uh, one person did ask. You know, what does delirium look like for people? I think you covered that pretty well. But keep that in mind if if you can and sort of uh, if that is something you can talk about with some of these other questions. Okay. There's a few questions that relate to, um, you know, what what is, well, here's a good one. Can dementia be reversed if the person stops using medication that may cause these dementia-like symptoms? So going off the anticholinergics, does that reverse the symptoms of dementia? You know, I think that up to a certain degree, I think that there is a point of no return uh, but I think that, you know, when I first see a patient, uh, part of the workup and part of um, what the doctor should be thinking about is what are the reversible causes of dementia? So these are things like, yes, A, anticholinergic drugs, but also urinary tract infections, uh, deficiencies in vitamin B12 and vitamin D, as well as other medications like beta blockers and things like that that can be affected cognition. Uh, things like hyper and hypothyroidism, 
uh, other types of infections, metabolic uh, issues. So um, in, in, the, in the initial workup, uh, the, the whole point would be, can we try to find things that can help us to reverse this? However, once the dementia has set in and you're in the moderate to severe stages of the disease and you've been taking you know, ditropan for uh, seven or eight years and we stop it, um, you may be calmer and the cognition may improve some, but I don't think it'll be enough to actually reverse the dementia. Yeah. And I think I've heard you say before, and I know from your own experience um, many, many years ago when you had severe back pain, that, the, that there, if you need medications, you have to take what you need. For Do sure. Do you want to speak to that just briefly? Uh, I want to make sure that we make that clear. Absolutely. Yes. And that is really important because, you know, um, I want to increase your awareness of the potential issues that these medications can cause because this may be the medicine that can save your life as well. And um, like Susan just said, you know, I, I've had three back surgeries and for months I was taking muscle relaxants and I was taking medications for pain, which were both anticholinergic. And, uh, and I took them and, and thank God that they were there and that they were available. So what is important is for us to be educated about this so that we can try to minimize the use. But the, you know, the medicine that really gives you that quality of life back may be an anticholinergic, but at least you can go in there with your eyes open, so to speak, and then the next medication that comes, then you can be kind of more aware of uh, you know, what your next choice of medicine should be. Right. Thank you for that. And I think it, it, you did say many times, I think it's so important um, to talk to your primary care physician. And also, this is about finding a balance between um, what is going to help you clear the fog, so to speak, that is sometimes created by these medications, um, but that also you're able to function, obviously. So those are all really important. One quick medication question. Sure. Does magnesium have any interaction with thyroid medication? Not that I know of, yeah. Um, Probably I, talk to your physician, to, yeah, but that's I, a good I, question. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think so, but yes, I would definitely look it up. You know, I uh, you know, can probably Google that fairly easily. So someone kind of just wanted to know about the, um, how dangerous the medications are. Can a dose of one of these drugs cause further cognitive decline if taken just for a few days? You know, it depends. It depends. It depends on the particular medication, and it depends how long and what dose uh, was taking. I have had uh, people who have been already fairly established in their dementia, who uh, the primary care doctor or the spouse went to the pharmacy and put them on Benadryl, and they took Tylenol PM because they were up at night. And within a couple of doses, yes, you can begin to see some pretty significant problems. However, if there is less of a cognitive problem, or if, of, um, then, then you may be able to take it without, many, without a significant sequela for quite some time. So it really depends. Um, can, can you speak, I know this is a, this, I mean, we could talk all day and I want to be mindful. Just quickly, uh, Dr. Rivera, how much time do you want for your exercise? Five minutes? Yeah, Seven, just eight like minutes? maybe like three, four minutes. Okay, to show, good. Like two slides and maybe five minutes. Oh, good, good, good. Okay. Yeah, we'll so, just do a little tiny thing. So um, I just wanted to speak to you know you talked about delirium and I think you 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 articulated it so well in comparing it to dementia, right? It's an acute change. I think the question that was just asked about can uh, one dose of these drugs cause further cognitive decline also speaks to say the Benadryl did cause a delirium in a hospitalized patient. Um, do you expect the delirium to clear? What, what, how does delirium clear and how does it not? Uh, for sure. And actually that was part of what was included in that famotidine study is that they had those six patients who came in, they put them on Pepsid or the famotidine they went, you know, they had delirium and, and the delirium cleared by stopping the medicine. So yes, for sure. The, these anticholinergics are notorious for precipitating delirium. And if you stop them, many times the delirium clears up. 
Wonderful. Just like so many times they can have a urinary tract infection and you treat the urinary tract infection and the cognition can improve dramatically, the behaviors, the hallucinations, all those things. Perfect example. Um, so uh, um, my friend here has an interesting question um, and, I'll, and I'll ask this as quickly as I can. His mother had a second stroke in July. Um, she started hearing a repetitive phrase of music in her head, but was persuaded that it was coming from outside. It happens in the AM and PM but sometimes during the day as well, it's driving her, it's driving her nuts. Um, the only new medication she's been taking is Remeron. Is there any correlation? You know, um, Remeron has anticholinergic properties. It is not a super strong anticholinergic, but it does have some anticholinergicity with it. Um, you know, the effect of anticholinergic drugs is cumulative. So for example, if, if uh, she was taking Remeron and also famotidine and also, you know, Lasix, for example, and the Lasix is a mild anticholinergic, you know, and the Remeron is not so great, but, you know, also those three medicines together can create a significant anticholinergic burden. Um, that being said, you know, um, one of my teachers in my residency program will always say, you know, Miguel, the proof is in the pudding. So my thought would be, if you think that Remeron is making her worse, then just stop it for a few days. Just talk to the doctor. You talk to the doctor, just, right? Oh, yeah. yeah we don't want anybody doctor. just to stop something without yes, talking to the yes. doctor. Right? You know, you just express your concern. You know, yeah. hey, I think that she's been more confused or not doing so well since we started this medicine. Can we, can we hold it for, particularly at the beginning of therapy, you don't have to be concerned about tapering things off. Right. But since you're thinking about something that was recently introduced and now you're seeing something, um, my uh, immediate response would be to maybe put the medicine on hold and wait and see how things go before adding anything to the mix. Right. But yes, you know, any, any psychoactive medicine is worth looking into because even if it wasn't via the anticholinergic side effects, it could be from some other effects from the medicine that uh, they're bringing about these changes that you're seeing. Um, I, there is a question here about what was the uh, over-the-counter antihistamine that you recommended? That was Allegra, correct? Allegra, yeah. Good yeah. job, Susan. No, the person asked it. No, it was, the, it was in the question. She, she yes. guessed. It was not my uh, memory. Yes. Trust yes. me. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if, um, okay, let me see. Our patient license, right? Um, someone's been taking Synthroid for hypothyroidism for about 20 years. Might that condition or the medication cause dementia? No, I, I do not. Um, I am not aware of any link at all between dementia and hypothyroidism or okay. to Synthroid or any of the thyroid hormones. And taking care of thyroid things is so important. For sure. Actually, yeah. it's, it's one of the things that actually, if you're out of whack, you know, like if you're severely hypothyroid, it can appear like dementia. Right. So it's right. one of the things in the initial screening for reversible causes of dementia is to check thyroid function. And our wonderful nurse practitioner and our memory care program and the Dementia Care Collaborative um, put a response in here. Always take your thyroid medication first thing in the morning on an empty stomach prior to taking other medications, 30 to 60 minutes before other medications. Thank you, Gabrielle, our gold wonderful- Gold star. Gold star for our nurse practitioner today. Um, so I actually, I'm, there's a little more uh, questions about the uh, person who was on Rimeron. I'm going to hold off on that for time's sake, and maybe I can forward that to you, Dr. Rivera, um, in an email. I am happy to answer, okay. yes. Great, great. Um, so I, it, just if you could just review quickly again the uh, anticholinergic drugs versus the dementia treatment drugs, which are anticholinesterase inhibitors. Okay. And that might be in your slides, correct? I'm wondering if maybe we could share your slides if people are interested. I don't know. Now, you know, Susan, I am not sure I can back up. Oh, that's here. okay. That's okay. I'm just yes, wondering if- Yes, I oh, can. Yes, can. I can. There we go. And then we want to, we want to stop. This will be the last question because we want to do the exercise. We just have five minutes left. Okay. All righty. So I'm going to use my little cursor. Um, so the, the issue with the anticholinergics and the dementia medicines are like in this little area here. 
So here's acetylcholine coming in from the, the little vesicle here on the lower end of the button. And then you see that it's got two, two choices. One choice is that it can bind the acetylcholine receptor. And this is where it does its job with muscle contraction or it does its job with improving our cognition and supporting our memory and learning. So, uh, however, if, if acetylcholine is coming down and then there is Benadryl sitting here, then, then the acetylcholine cannot bind to the receptor. So this is the problem with an a anticholinergic is that it blocks the ability of acetylcholine to bind to the receptor and do what it's supposed to do. Gotcha. Now, the other thing that acetylcholine could do is this little green thing here, you see it says here anti-acetylcholinesterase. So this is the enzyme that downgrades or degrades the acetylcholine. So you see the acetylcholine uh, 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 shows up in the presence of the acetylcholinesterase and the acetylcholinesterase kind of returns it to its constituent parts. So it recycles it. So the medicines like Aricept, Razadine, and Exelon work by inhibiting this enzyme. So the acetylcholine that is on the cleft cannot be broken down. Gotcha. So okay. that is quite complicated, and you and I sort of understand that. So <laughs> I'm wondering, though, if um, this is a great, again, any questions that people have about these, uh, the dementia medications um, and the combination, you know, if there are questions about being on an anticholinergic uh, medication, that the most important thing is to talk to your doctor about the potential interference or or in the importance of having those anticholinergic medications or not. So, because uh, we have now just, to, just about three minutes, Miguel. So I wanna um, give you an opportunity to talk about what, what are some, what's an exercise we might be able to do to help us sleep at night. And I know people may have to sign off, but if, but if you can stay, please do. We may go over just a few minutes. Okay, so yes, let me just show you, oh boy. Oh, uh, we may have to go through all these slides now. Uh oh. Uh, hmm. Yeah, this may be kind of time consuming. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just talk about it? Um, sure. So, you know, what I was going to, to talk about is this. Um, our breath is our friend. And, uh, and I say that because what science shows us, and in a uh, perfect day, I would have been able to show you some studies, but these studies uh, show that our emotional patterns, our emotions are linked to the way that we breathe. Miguel, so, do you want to turn off your slides? Because you're very small on our screen right now. I would love to uh, see. Certainly. I just to stop. stop there you are. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's see. So the, what these studies are showing, and you know, there's many of them by now, is that there is a particular breath pattern that is associated with all of our emotions so that when we breathe a certain way, um, when, we, when we get angry, we breathe a certain way. When we're happy, we breathe a certain way. When we are uh, frightened, we breathe a certain way. And um, one of the, these studies identified uh, that there is a trinity of uh, systems that come together to help us feel in particular ways. And what I mean by this is that there seems to be a synergy between our breath, our facial expression, and our posture. So they call these effector, emotional effector uh, programs. So basically what they did in this particular study was that they trained actors to fake out these emotions. And the way that they uh, uh, recreated them was they breathed in a certain way, they, they recreated a particular 
um, facial expression and they also carried themselves their body in a particular way. And what they found is that they could reliably recreate those emotions and they actually started feeling the way that they were initially kind of faking. Which, you know, uh, Nori was mentioning yesterday uh, about Amy Cuddy's work, and she's, you know, Harvard scientist, uh, about fake it till you make it. So um, I just wanted to just bring this area uh, or this uh, research uh, to you guys today as a way to help you understand that it doesn't matter kind of how you feel. Uh, you can always make yourself feel a little bit better if you become more mindful about what your breath is doing, what facial expression you're having, and what is your posture. So that being said, what I would like to do is we can just try this for just a few minutes. So regardless of what you're doing, just go ahead and, and sit up on your chair and, um, and kind of straighten out your back and you may close your eyes as you um, see fit. And then just take a second to kind of come to this moment and, and take a moment to kind of feel what your breath is doing and kind of where it's going. Feel your physical sensations, feel your feet and feel the earth underneath them and the earth supporting them and Continue then to feel your knees and your thighs. Feel how your uh, breath just moves in and out, just slowly. And, um, and then think of your spine almost like as an antenna. So you want to lengthen your spine as you relax your shoulders. And then take a quick look at your or a quick feel towards your facial expression. Take a second and maybe think of uh, your favorite puppy or your favorite kitty cat and or your favorite uh, person or your favorite dessert or you know anything that will put a pleasant uh, smile or a pleasant um, um, disposition on your on your face and just allow then the breath to just slowly be brought down from our upper lungs into the lower spaces of our lungs. So not necessarily adding any effort to it, but just consciously bringing the air to the base of our lungs. And then allow for a slow, Exhale. So the idea is to allow the relaxation response to begin to set in. And one of the quickest ways of getting the relaxation response is to come to this moment. And one of the quickest ways to come to this moment is to place our awareness on the breath because our breath is happening right now. And what the science shows is that when we become mindful of our breath, there's different areas of the brain that begin to light up that show increased coherence. And these are areas that have to do with sensory processing, with emotional control, with improved cognition and improved memory and language use. So just by becoming mindful, what we call breathing above the brainstem, from taking the breath from being automatic to just us becoming aware of its presence, when we begin to just little by little lengthen the exhale, Dr. Rivera, can I suggest that this is also a teaser for your talk in two weeks? You know, this really is because next week we are talking two about, yeah, actually two in two weeks. weeks, we're talking about the fight or flight response and how is it that our body reacts to stress and what are some everyday tools that we can use to help us uh, become more peaceful because, you know, this is when we heal. 
when we are stressed out, when the fight or flight response is activated, uh, we are in an emergency situation, the healing mechanisms of the body are kind of put on hold. Once we begin to relax and we begin to connect with the breath and we become more peaceful, then our healing mechanisms begin to kick in. And so the best thing we can do is to try to be as calm and peaceful as we can. That way we give our innate healing mechanisms a chance to work for us. That's such a beautiful way to wrap up. Thank you so much, Dr. Rivera. I appreciate you so much. I want to thank everyone for hanging in there with us. We went a little over about six minutes, not too, too bad. Oh, we're so we trouble. look, <laughs> we're in trouble. Look forward to seeing you all in two weeks. Um, actually on t this, but even before that on Tuesday evening is our uh, conversations with caregivers, um, which is going to be about uh, ambiguous loss. It's such an important topic, especially during these days. Um, our chapter in the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine, Sarah Byrne Martelli, is going to talk to us about uh, learning to cope with um, and learning to live with ambiguous loss. So please join us for that. Thank you, everyone. If you want to turn on your camera before you say goodbye, we would love that because I like to say goodbye to everyone. Um, and remember that we're all here together. It's good to see your faces. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Great end to your week. Thank you.